Hi, uh, welcome again. Uh, in case you've forgotten, I'm Mireille. Um, so now for something completely different. So the previous talk you saw, it was about um, an application of, of Appalachia of model checking some basic principles to a particular thing. Um, this is a bit more theoretical. Um, so this is joint work with some uh, very nice people from University of Michigan, uh, Amon and Karem, and Stefan Maritz from INRIA, and as well as Ibra and myself. Um, so Krem, who was originally uh, supposed to give this talk, unfortunately couldn't be here due to medical reasons. Um, I'm going to do my best to do IC3PO, so their technique justice. Um, and I apologize in advance if I, get, uh, if I get something slightly wrong on that topic. But yeah, so this talk, re-TLA. So what's this talk going to be about? So this talk is going to be about um, basically the versatility of TLA and uh, how you can handle special fragments of TLA in a more efficient way and how you can compose TLA or Apalache with other tools, in this case, I see 3 po All right, so um, all right. where I'm going to start is, is something slightly different from, from what you've seen before. So this is a, an example protocol. This is a slice from Karim. Uh, client-server protocol. So the setting is this. You have some number of clients and servers, and you have um, basically one, at most one client uh, per server that you're allowed to have connected. So you can have behavior that's something like this. So client one expresses the desire to connect to server one. Um, and it takes that lock. And then at some point it says, okay, I've had enough. And it releases that lock, at which point right, the lock becomes uh, locked again. And now client two can request it. Um, but it cannot happen that both client uh, clients one and client two simultaneously hold server one, right? So this is our, this is our example client server protocol. And um, what you can do, for, the set, for, for a moment, let's, let's forget about TLA. So what you can do is you can specify this um, in, uh, in Ivy. So you can write a relational encoding, which actually is what someone has already done for us. And the important parts are, you don't have to go into the details of all the Ivy encoding stuff. Um, that you have basically three components to this, right? And, you know, if you're familiar with TLA, these should sound vaguely familiar, right? If you have an initial state, uh, you have transitions, and you have properties, right? So the, the, the framework is actually very similar. It's just about the language fragment and the expressibility and what you can do with it, right? Um, all right, technical difficulties? All right, great. Yeah, so the difference is um, here you have, well, you can quantified formulas um, in TLA as well, um, but you can't really have, or you, the tools that currently exist don't really necessarily support unbounded quantification or quantification over infinite sets, right? And that's something you can do here and you cannot do in TLA. Or, to be specific, you can do it in TLA, you can't do it in TLC or Apalache. So there's a bunch of tricks that you can do um, in TLC where you say, well, my natural numbers are actually just a big range. In Apalache, you can do it under certain conditions um, because you can translate something like x is an int as a, as a constraint fairly nicely into x is a term of sort int in SMT and then no additional constraints over that. Um, but, you, you know, there's a bunch of things that you cannot do even with it. Um, so the question is, you know, can... Can we facilitate something like this, but in TLA? And that's, before we answer that question, so let's look at something you can already do with this. So IC3PO was a technique that was designed by um, Karam and Amon, right? Um, and it's a technique that basically, this is even worse somehow than the other one, right? Um, so it's a technique that, that basically covers a lot of things. So here's here's, um, the full slide as provided by Karen. So I'm gonna try to do my best to um, describe what happens here. So the basic gist is they're trying to extract and prove inductive invariance, right? And the way they do this is by doing a bunch of intermediate things um, that I think I'm gonna show better on the next slide. But um, the key thing here is that they have a system that proves um, inductive invariance by basically iteratively extending the concrete system. So you can think of this sort of as, as like the, oh, what's this one, uh, counter, so the Seagard technique. If you've, 
It's something similar to that in, in, in principle. Um, so they've actually, you know, they, they've tested their technique against um, some of the other tools that do automatic inductive invariant uh, inference. And it's actually, you know, it, it for almost all of the uh, problems, it found solutions and it did it so relatively quickly, at least better compared to its competitors here. I'm just going to use the mouse. Yeah, it's going to be faster. All right. So this is how I see 3PO works, right? So you start off with, with a protocol and a property. Um, and so the reason I showed IV first is because what they do actually is they take IV and they translate IV into a language called VMT. So VMT is a cousin of SMT. Um, you, can think, you can think in your head, you can think SMT for the most part. They're very similar, except you have some top-level annotations. Um, so they translate the protocol into this language, and then they instantiate it with a finite instance. So for example, in, the pre in, in this um, client-server protocol, you say, okay, I'm going to start off with um, three clients and two servers. Right? And then... They do. Uh, they use their um, so regularity aware IC3 technique um, to basically uh, try to figure out if there is a counterexample, right? Because remember, if you have like uh, if you have a system and you have a finite instance of that system, and that finite instance already displays a counterexample, then of course the property doesn't hold in general for all instances, right? Um, but what if it does, right? So if you have a counterexample, you have a counterexample. What if the invariant holds for this size of your system? Well, then there is something called convergence. So basically, this is the property of, by verifying this finite system, I know that no system of larger size behaves in a different way with respect to, to this property than this finite system. Right? And so there is basically, again, one of two things that can happen. Either you know, you've proved that finite convergence holds, in which case, you know, for this finite, finite size, you've checked the system, you know that it, it doesn't change its behavior for larger sizes, therefore you have a proof. And you output the proof and, and the invariance as they are. Or, um, that's not true, it's not converged yet. Well, in, in that case, you just go back to the initial problem and just increase the size of your system. Right, so you pick, okay, so it's not going to work for three clients and two servers because there's some different behavior when you have three servers. So let's run this thing again with three clients, three servers. Is there any difference in behavior now? Again, for three clients, four servers, ah, oh, wait, actually, three clients, four servers behaves in exactly the same way with respect to the invariant. To three servers, I'm done. Right, something like that. Okay, so why, like, how does this relate now back to TLA? So, uh, Karam and Aman approached this. They had this technique, IC3PO. It needed VMT files. It needed IV translated into VMT. Um, can we make it work with TLA as an input language? That was basically, that was basically the question. Right? So they wanted, to, they wanted to use, instead of IV, uh, they wanted to use TLA+. Right? And so you can't just, of course, you can't just plug in TLA+, because there's this, you know, how do you even turn TLA+, into VMT? Well, Enter Appalachia. Right? Appalachia already translates TLA plus into SMT. So the question was, you know, can we come up with a sort of automatic translation uh, using Appalachia from TLA, not to SMT, but to VMT, um, and then plug that back into this IC3PO technique and then get all of, all of the uh, proving power of IC3PO from the for the original source TLA file, right? So this is the combination of techniques. So our goal here is this, right, figuring out what this arrow is. So how does Apalache make VMT constraints? Um, can it even do it for which language fragment and so on? Right? And right. so enter retla relational TLA. So spoiler alert, this is not going to work for the entirety of TLA+. Um, and so we had to come up with a fragment of TLA+, for which this transformation does work, right? And we dubbed this fragment re-TLA because, re for relational, um, because as it turns out, this is basically the IV-like fragment, but just in TLA. Um, and we'll see what that means in one second. Yeah. So what is re-TLA? 
So retla is a subset of tla that has it has literals. So true, false, zero, you know, booleans, integer strings. These you know from uh, well standard tla. These are some Apalache specific constructs. So um, remember, Apalache has a type system, and it supports something called uninterpreted types. So you can, you can compare this to, for example, model values in TLC. So you can say, I have a value that is of a certain type. So for example, I have a value of type T. That's, you know, the name of this value is one of T. The name of this value is X of Y, and this has type Y. And uninterpreted, um, uninterpreted values are just different from one another if they have a different identifier. And that's the only property they have. So one of T is different from two of T, and that's, that's it. Right? And at the SMT level, again, this has a very natural correspondence. You just instantiate a, a sort, uninterpreted sort, and then different values of that sort are different. Right? So this is an Apalachia specific thing. We still allow this here because it's a, it's a useful abstraction tool because usually when you're, um, when you're dealing with things, you care about, for example, process labels that are different. What they are doesn't usually matter. It can be strings, it can be integers, they just have to be different. And this is like a very natural way of, of just using distinct values. I'm going to come back to this. So this has an asterisk associated to it. Um, but for now, um, yeah, so these are things you can write. So the other things you can write, so sets. So we had to exclude the majority of set operations, and I'll explain why in a second. But like in, in the core language fragment, you can use these sets so that are basically the int, nat, and boolean, as well as anything that's constant declare with type set t. So these sets will play a role in quantification, and I have to emphasize here that the semantics are slightly different than what you might be used to. So um, any set that's used in quantification is treated as a sort defining set instead of as a value set. So what this means is that if I see something, if I have a constant that's uh, typed with, I don't know, set of integers, that set is treated as the set of all integers. Um, because into SMT, you propagate constraints that are basically sort-based, not value-based. Right? So this, this might, you know, the semantics, if you have something like set of Y, and Y is an uninterpreted type, this means all of Y, any, any value of type Y. It's just we can use, so typically, you, you know, if you want to talk about the set of all Ys, you just introduce a constant and, uh, take you in a second, and just type it with set Y, yeah. Just to make sure I get this. Um, so that means that we cannot have a variable that is, has the value of a set of same, what would be tip model values in TLC, right? Sorry? If you have a variable that is, for example, modeling a set of model values, that's not going to work here. No, you cannot. So okay. importantly, you cannot use a set as a value. So no variable may hold a value that is a set of something. And that's actually... so. There are ways, and I'm going to talk about this, this is very important, there are ways of representing sets without using sets, and this is actually what the, the fragment is about. So we actually disallow sets as values, but we allow them as um, domains for quantifiers, essentially. So you could get around this, actually. So this is, um, so you could get around this by using unbounded quantification and type information, but this, uh, this requires a bit more understanding of, of Appalachia, where this is more, usually more readable, uh, with this caveat. Okay, so the other stuff that's supported, um, inequality, and I guess some people call it disequality, I call it inequality, but like equals not equals. Um, all of the Boolean operators, uh, quantifiers, uh, bounded quantifiers in this case, because you have to sort defining sets, and then functions. All right, so functions, uh, you can define a function as long as you know every uh, domain component is a restricted set, so it's one of these. Uh, and you can update a function, and of course you can reference a function. No, choose is not part of this. No, no, no. So um, just to like skip ahead a little bit because of these questions. So the reason why this fragment is chosen is because most of these things have very direct one-to-one -one, um, SMT equivalents, right? So um, basically in the SMT here, this is just an application of a function. That's a built-in thing. This is easily expressible, as is this. Um, I'll show you how in a second. But like, this is the reason why this fragment is this. So you can build on top of this. So this is, in, in some sense, like a semantic core. You can build syntactic transformations from other, uh, so from like TLA language constructs um, into this core. And I'm going to talk about how we're going to do this in a moment. 
But essentially, like, this is the, the bare minimum that you need and that you can define this translation easily for. Um, right. So I, I, I said, like, asterisks on integers. So there is um, there's an interesting thing we do with integers that you might not immediately... Um, you know, immediately understand. So integers in this, um, in this interpretation are not integers. So integers are a syntactic uh, shorthand for some sort with a total order, right? So in, the, in particular, you cannot do integer arithmetic because, you know, if you remember, this was not one, plus was not one of the operators that was supported in retail A. But you can, you can use, and unfortunately this was not on the slide, you can use actually... Um, the comparison operator, right? All, all four of them, I just list one. Um, but you can use the comparison operator. And this is sometimes important because you have, proto you know, you have protocols that say, uh, that talk about uh, process takes a step if it has the lowest identifier or something like that. And for that, you, you need a total order. But this is the only part of the integers that you actually need. So you need, of course, you need the property that one is different from zero because otherwise the integers don't make sense. Um, but aside from that, you don't need any arithmetic. You just need an order in its property. So what we do is with integers, you write at the input level, you write the integers. At the back end level, we translate them into an uninterpreted sort with axiomatically defined total order. Right? So if you write some, if, if your specification in some place uses one, somewhere else uses eight, somewhere else uses 71. At the back end, there's going to be A, B, and C of a certain sort. I don't have to care about which sort. And assertions that A, B, and C are in, this, in the same order that the integers would naturally be in. So the reason you can do this is because in any given specification, you can only use finitely many integer con uh, literals. So in the back end, you can just do finitely many of these assertions, and you're good. Um, a consequence of this, which is, again, not immediately obvious, is that you lose certain properties that you actually assume from real integers. So concretely, um, in, in the standard interpretation of integers, if you know that A is between 4 and 6 strictly, then A must be 5 because the integers go from 4 to 5 to 6. Um, because, in this, um, because in this retail A mode, integers are your syntax sugar, this doesn't necessarily hold because you don't have this property of... Uh, basically um, no gaps, right? So between four and six, theoretically, there is an unlimited number of quote-unquote integers um, that are all greater than four and lesser than six, right? So you lose this property. This almost never matters. The thing that people usually, or at least in this fragment, care about is the uh, inequality, and this is just syntax sugar for support. All right, so... This is about as much as I want to talk about the fragment itself. Let's, let's go into actual examples. So how does this work? Why does this work? So the guiding principle behind all of this, right, the reason why retail A works, is this principle of set function duality. Right? So I, I'm sure you've heard about this. If, you, if you've taken a statistics course, right, you've heard probably the term index function or characteristic function. Right? So instead of a set... If you have two sets that are a subset of some universe of values u, right, you can think of these two sets as functions that map from that, from that universe, from that sort, to bool. Right? So if a set 1, 2, 3, you can think of it as a, as a mapping from integers to Boolean, where it maps 1, 2, and 3 to true, and the rest to false. Right? Um, and so this is, sort, this is actually the reason why all of the sets that we allow in quantifiers are sort-defining in a sense, right? Because all of these characteristic functions, they have to range over the entire universe of values or over the entire sort. So and then you have these dualities, and a bunch of set operations translate really, really nicely into functions, right? So membership in the set is just, is the characteristic function applied to that value equal to true? If yes, then x is in s, if f is the function representation of s. If not, then, f is, uh, then x is not an s. Right? Intersection, well, intersection is just the composition in the mapping. So x is an element of s cap t if x maps to f of x and g of x if g is a representation of t and f is a representation of s. Um, set filtering is the same thing. Actually, uh, intersection is just a special case of set filtering, right, where you filter by membership in T. So it's, if you have a set that's defined via predicate, then, well, you map the elements to F and the predicate. 
Right? So it's very straightforward. So the reason why you cannot do this for all of TLA um, is that you have more than just these, these operations on set. So in particular, for example, if you have a mapping, right? So if you have a set S and then you map Q over it. So for example, no, X squared for every element in S and S is one, two, three, right? Um, the problem is here that if you try to think of this as a function, um, the value that this function maps to um, is quantified. And uh, that's typically problematic for solvers to handle. Or I, I don't want to say impossible, but like it's not usable in practice. So you can't really translate these expressions, at least not automatically. So sometimes you might get lucky when you're doing this translation manually. So for example, if Q is an invertible function, and then you can use the inverse of Q in your translation. But this is, if you think about it, you cannot have an automatic, you cannot automatically define whether or not Q is invertible because that would require you to have solvers for every single theory that you could possibly write in, in TLA. So, you know, if you have, if Q of X is X squared, you would need to be able to, within TLA or within Appalachia, somehow com compute the inverse of the X to X squared function. Or like in general, you know, Q could be a polynomial of degree seven. And then in that case, you know that there is in general no, uh, no inverse. No, that's no root, but also how do you find the inverse? It might have one, it might not, depending on the range. It's too complicated to do this automatically. So basically because of this, forget about the entirety of TLA. And of course, this is just, you know, this is just an example within sets. Then there's tuples, there's records, there's all sorts of complicated things. So in general, this works really well for a lot of things. And if you, th if you think about it, just with these basic set operations, you know, additions, intersections, filtering, um, union is also, union is disjunction, so that's also easy, um, as is negation. So with all of these things, you can already describe a large chunk of thing. Uh, so you can already translate a large chunk of specifications that use this manually or automatically into this, right? So retla, while it's syntactically restrictive, is actually not that difficult in practice to, to um, well, right. Um, of course, it is usually the case that it's a little bit difficult to read. Um, and I'll show you an example of, of how to do this. But before I go into that, so uh, this is in particular a translation using Appalachia, right? And so one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to change as little as possible about Appalachia um, in order to generate this um, retla translation. So above here, you see um, sort of a description of the Appalachia pipeline. So you might have seen when Philip ran the experiments earlier, there's like a bunch of things that happened, and then at the end you had this, oh, no error, or oh, counterexample found. Right? So Appalachia does a lot of things, and we want to basically use all of this existing work for free uh, in order to use this retla uh, translation to VMT. So Appalachia, first, first thing it does, it has a type inference engine, right? This is actually super critical for us because SMT is also typed, right? So um, Appalachia uses type inference and it type checks your specification. Whether it's written or in retla or normal TLA is a critical first step. The second thing, and here this, you know, this box lies a little bit, it's called pre-processing, but this pre-processing is actually a lot of things, right? This pre-processing, is uh, operator instantiation. This preprocessing is constant rewriting. This preprocessing is um, like propagation, simplification. It's a lot of things, right? Um, if you go look at, um, if you run Appalachia, if you go look at the output, it'll show you that between types and transition decomposition, there's uh, six, seven, or eight pa different passes of things that happen. So all of that, with retla, you get for free. The last thing, Philip talked about this already, is transition decomposition. Um, so Appalachia, basically, when you give it a next predicate, it splits that next into a number of symbolic transitions. Next one, next two, next three, next four, et cetera, such that next is the disjunction of all of these, but these are in some sense atomic. And on all of these transitions, you know, you, you have uniquely defined assignments to every variable. Um, and so this is also where this pipeline kind of stops, right? So from here, Appalachia typically, what it does is it takes these symbolic transitions and it has a set of rewriting rules. So this is the part where Appalachia generates SMT. 
right? So it takes TLA code, um, and it has basically an iterative loop where it turns TLA into slightly simpler TLA plus SMT constraints plus auxiliary data structure. And then it re repeats this until it's done with all of the TLA, and all that's left is a data structure you don't care about anymore and a large chunk of SMT constraints. And that's the basic, that's the basic loop. But, so these rules are very general. So these rules have to work for any sort of TLA, for records, for tuples, for sets, for sequences, you name it, right? And so because re-TLA is, is much simpler than all of TLA, um, you need diff or you want different rules, simpler rules that eventually just give you VMT. So you want to keep this, you want to change this a little bit, and then VMT is very slightly different from SMT, so this part is cheap. Okay, so this is an example of a function application rule in Appalachia, just to see, uh, just to highlight basically how much easier a re-TLA is to handle um, when it comes to transforming to SMT. So don't try to understand the entirety of this rule. Um, I just want to show a couple of components. So in order to understand function application, functions have finite domains. Finite uh, domains mean sets. So in order to understand function application, you have to understand the domain of the function, which is a set. You have to have this auxiliary structure that keeps an number of approximations of sets. You have to transform all of this into constraints by using uh, basically choice from this uh, element domain. It's complicated. There's a bunch of stuff, and you end up with a result that's you know, a complicated SMT formula. For what looks like a simple thing, you're just applying a function uh, to an element, but the, behind the scenes, there's a lot that's happening because of this representation of functions, something that maps from a finite set to a codomain, right? Um, and so this is what the same uh, translation rule looks like in, in VMT or uh, in, in this retail So if your function is represented by an SMT function G, and your argument, which is TLA, is represented by an SMT value Y, then your function application is just G applied to Y. Very simple, right? So the reason, and this, the reason this is simple is because you've basically thrown away all of this logic about sets. So you don't have any sets anymore, and all you're left with, at least in this particular case, is function application, which is a native concept in SMT. So very, very simple. Um, and all of the rules are approximately as complicated as this. So there's, a, you know, there's slight caveats when it comes to um, function definitions, because you're introducing new, new functions. Not, it's not too difficult, there's just a little bit of bookkeeping involved. Right? But this is the takeaway, right? If you have a simpler fragment, you don't have to support TLA in all of its generality, then you can come up with a much, much more efficient representation. Um, yeah, so here is a video now, like how do all of these things come together? Um, this is this was done by Aman. So this is the specification of this client server protocol in re-TLA. It's just normal TLA, right? It has Apalache annotations, but besides that, it's, it's TLA. You could plug this into TLC if you wanted to, or any other tool, right? It's re-TLA, and this is the property that we're interested in. This is... Um, sort of no two clients lock the same server. And so the first thing that you do is you run this, um, so this is just a, a, an, a call to Apalache that's hidden. So you say, okay, I, I care about invariant safety, and then you run Apalache in this translation mode, and you get, uh, so you get a VMT file. And then all you have to do is use this VMT file, which we'll see in a second, you use this VMT file, and this is an input to IC3PO. So you could, you know, of course, you could automate this part. You can make a script that directly calls one after the other. This is just done for uh, demonstration purposes. And this is what the VMT file looks like, right? So it, it, it's SMT, but it has top-level labels, and it has some connections between current and next state. But for the most part, it's just SMT. Yeah, and then you use this VMT file. You plug it into IC3PO. IC3PO does its magic. And so remember, IC3PO starts with... Uh, an instance of a given size. Um, so here you can see like clients and servers, they're using uninterpreted types and they become uninterpreted source in SMT. Right. Yeah, and then I see 3PO runs and says, okay, you, you started with, oh, what was it, two and three? Oh, I can actually look here. Yeah. 
And then it eventually ended up checking three and four. All right, so two and three you started with, we ended with three and four. Um, it's all good, and we found an inductive invariant, which we're gonna show in a second. So this is the inductive invariant, whatever this is. And this is pretty much it, right? This is how you compose tools. You basically write, uh, share, like, uh, input to one tool is the output to the other, right? Okay, so experiments. So this is, again, courtesy of Amon. So he ran experiments on a bunch of TLA specs. So you have client server, which, you know, uh, IC3PO finds the invariant to be the original property plus this. So this is something that it detected. Uh, Tcommit is just a property. It's already an inductive invariant. Two-phase. Uh, you can see here for two phase, you know, it found a bunch of things that weren't part of the original property, but there are combined required this is lemmas basically to an inductive invariant, um, key value and decentralized lock. All of these things, really, really quickly, a couple of seconds here to find all of this. Right? Yeah, and as for you know, um, as for the cutoff sizes, so how, how many iterations of the IC three PO loop actually? that many uh, from one one to two one, that's one extra step. So from one, two, one four is actually done. So from one four to two five, that's two extra steps or maybe even one. Uh, and then from here, three extra steps, three extra steps. So not that much, right? So it's typically the case, or at least in a lot of these cases, you reach this uh, cutoff size relatively quickly, which is why this, is, uh, this doesn't take as long, right? It's a couple of seconds in the previous slide. Um, yeah, so that's the story. So what is there to be done? Well, um, so you've seen this translation, right, that I've shown you. Um, and I said this was done by hand. And that's kind of sort of, uh, that's the point where it becomes tedious to use if you don't have uh, very experienced users. Because the retaila fragment, uh, while it is very expressive, is not the easiest thing to write in. So. I actually, I don't know why I seem to have skipped over some slides. Ah, okay, so apparently somehow these slides never showed up, and I'm gonna go back to them now. I'm gonna talk about two-phase commit, right? Um, so actually a good point to talk about this. So this is the actual two-phase commit um, that on the left-hand side you see is written in standard TLA. Um, so the, the, the thing that's different here, and I'll talk about this in here. So these are the differences. So this is written in standard TLA. So you have, these, you don't have to mind, these are actually the same thing, right? So here you call the uninterpreted sort, you call it RM, here you call it sort RM. That's the same thing. So the difference is here, right? So here you're using a set of things, here you're using a function from the, this type to bool. Um, the other difference is here, so this is a common, you've seen this uh, probably, as a common pattern in message passing, passing algorithms, right? So you have a set of messages, but the contents of this set of messages are different kinds of messages. So for example, in Poxos, you have uh, 1A type messages, 1B type messages, 2A, 2B, right? And this is a common pattern. We have one set that contains many different things. Um, and these messages, they're all records. So Apalache has, a, has already a way of handling this behind the scenes. A uh, typical thing, and you can do this in standard TLA as well, but you kind of have to do it in read TLA, is that y if you have a set of messages that can contain n different things, different sorts of messages, it's almost always a good idea to split this into n different sets that all contain messages of the same sort. So here you have one set for commit messages, one set for abort messages, and one set for prepared messages. And then you translate them into, well, uh, a function and just two Boolean flags because the abort and the commit messages don't actually carry any content. It's just whether or not there is one or there isn't one. So this is an additional optimization. But essentially, um, it's typically not that hard. It go, it's very straightforward. So sets become functions. This is three different sets already become three different functions. This one is even simpler because you only care about whether these two messages are empty or not because commit is a message, but it has no content. So you're only checking for, for membership. Right. Um, so if you have a spec like this, what really changes in practice is, is that you change things like messages become something union something into messages becomes an accept. Right? And it's a bunch of these things. You have to do it manually for, for the moment, but it's a bunch of these things. So the translation actually is relatively straightforward. Right? 
the function set duality gives you like a nice set of blueprints for how you should do this, um, how you should do this in more or less every example. So that's the thing that I now want to return to because I somehow skipped these slides. My apologies. Is future work right? So this by hand is very tedious. <laughs> and one of the things we want to do in, in, in the future is come up with an automatic translation from as much of TLA as we can into this read TLA fragment. So for example, I told you there is this classic one-to-one -one between um, set membership and function application. Well, we can just do this automatically for you. Right? You don't need to think about how to rewrite this in principle. We could just have Apalache do all of this for you in, in, as part of preprocessing. Uh, that's sort of something we want to implement. But of course, you know, for the minimal working example, uh, you don't do that and you just do things by hand. Um, but if, if this is something that you'd be interested in, eventually we're going to support um, a lot more of TLA than is currently required. So re-TLA will become like a broader thing, right? And the thing that you've now seen as re-TLA, you can think of as like re-TLA core, and then you will have like the rest of re-TLA that translates into re-TLA core. So that's sort of the idea for the future. Um, and this sort of is the task here, right? Like what's the maximal fragment of TLA that you can automatically translate into re-TLA, right? Automatically meaning the user doesn't have to do anything, the tool does this behind the scenes. Um, and of course, you've seen the talk on Tendermint, right? And I, I foreshadowed this a little bit. Um, one of the things that you can do for Tendermint is you translate Tendermint into re-TLA. And spoilers, I've done some of this. Like, it's, an, it's not online anywhere. I've done some of this. Um, it's very, very unreadable in, in, like, in raw retail if you don't have this automatic translation. Right? So the, the difficulty there comes in, in the fact that a lot of specifications are actually not just meant for tools. They're also meant for humans. Right? And, and so if you, have a, if you expect your specification to be read by developers, for example, or engineers, um, sometimes if you use retla as it's currently uh, defined, it's like the, the narrowest possible form, uh, you're going to have trouble explaining this to, to engineers because you have to sort of give someone an intuition of these function sets, right? Because, for example, one thing that's very easy to think of is like a set of records with certain fields. That just becomes, so instead of having a set that contains a record that maps um, A to 1 and B to, to 3, you can have a function that's true at one three, right? So, but explaining the, what this means to an engineer is like, why is there a, an accept that one three equals true? What this means intuitively back to this notion of sending messages is sometimes a difficult thing. So you have to be, you know, uh, you have to have ideally a very, very broad language fragment that is still readable, but that's in the back end effectively machine translatable as sort of the ultimate goal. Um, so this work, um, so the retail stuff is part of Apalache. Um, it's, there, is a, there is a command you can invoke. It's called transpile. It's currently under development, let's say, so we're not yet quite comfortable. Um, you can find it on like a developer branch, but we're not quite comfortable exposing this to users yet because we want to get this stuff done before we do that. Um, if you really want to play with it, you can, you can contact me. I can, I can show you where to find this version that supports this. Um, this is the repository by Mon that uh, contains the things on their end, so the IV benchmarks, the uh, VMT translations of the things that um, they ran, uh, and this is already available, so you can find this there. Um, I think this is as much as I want to say on this topic today. So Philip already showed you all of the links to the Appalachia stuff, to the informal stuff. Uh, here's my email, so if you have any questions about this or, of course, about anything that you've heard previously today, uh, drop me a line. I'm happy to answer any questions now or over email. Okay, um, suppose that all of the examples are well typed for Apalachi. Mm -hmm. What percentage do you think could be translated to read TLA plus all of those 90? I'm actually fairly confident. Uh, I would, like, I don't want to give you like a percentage, but I won't say like a lot. I won't even say the majority because it's very. So if you think about it, um, what do typical protocols do? They send messages. They accumulate things in sets, right? Um, they, you know, these sets. They they do disjunctions. They do not disjunctions. Uh, they do uh, sorry, set minus operations, right? They do set unions, intersections, all that stuff. They don't typically. Um, 
do very complicated set mapping. Like it happens in a lot of places. Filtering, yes. Very, very complicated non-invertible set mappings, fairly rare, in, at least in my experience. Um, so those, again, like I don't think you can automatically translate set map in, in any case, but for a lot of them you can do it manually. Um, I hope that answers your question. I don't have like actual numbers to give you, like 30%, 70%. So, so uh, the set mapping example uh, that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, so you map a function uh, on the range of another function. If the set is a function, then you, you map the, yeah. the, the Q. And uh, so if you, um, so, so now you have a new set, and the new set is used in some formula or transition system. Uh, so, in the end, you're going to observe um, membership queries on that set. You, you, you're going to, uh, the formula is going to contain some queries on that set or, or okay. function. Um, and uh, so, if you, if you, the formula, so, so there's one set of results that have to do with if you have a finite, uh, a quantifier free formula that has a finite, then it has a finite set of observers on a given function, uh, or, or, you, or you can uh, compute a finite uh, set based on the formula uh, on the quantifier free. It might not be just the indexes used in the formula, but it, uh, there's a finite cover, right? And, and in that case, you can compile also the, the, um, the, the map. Uh, so, so, so uh, to say it in a different way, so, so in set three we have uh, something we call array property fragment uh, decision procedure, and we extend the theory of arrays uh, with a map function that, that allows you to map a function uh, on the range of an array, and that remains decidable um, for a simple reason that for quantifier free formulas that you end up just observing these arrays and a finite set of points. And we just expand the map to the finite set of points and they, they become array accesses mm -hmm. at the point. And, and, and it seems that, so, so the, the question is when in the TLA uh, RE setting, whether you could exploit such a properties that your, your sets are I mean, carried around because, but for, for succinctness, but you're observing them at a finite set of points. So I mean, so the question here is really how difficult is this existential to solve, right? So the, the problem is here that um, original set representation, if, if a set is, uh, so S is represented by F, right? The F domain is U. Uh, for the mapping, uh, you have to have the domain BV, which is the codomain of Q, right? Um, this is a thing you don't necessarily understand from this expression. I'm not, like, again, I'm not sure in general how much you can do here without throw, like, you can throw a quantifier at a solver, and in, in a lot of cases, it actually comes back with a result. Um, it is fairly unpredictable when it will succeed and at what time, though. That's sort of the problem here. Um, if you have, like, a good idea on how to do this, we can maybe talk offline. I'd be, like, I would be interested in hearing how you, you would do this in general. But so far, we haven't really found, like, a, an elegant way of encoding this that works um, with the rest of this. Uh, I like functional programming, so I think it might be a hammer and a nail sort of a thing. But um, is there a, so I do find myself mapping sets. Uh, is there, like, a general intuition of what to do kind of instead uh, and how best to avoid it or the common patterns that you've seen of, oh, you didn't need that, you should have done blank in order to avoid that? Um, I, like, I can't really give you like a one-size-fits-all answer for this. The, so the question is, like, when would you actually, think of, think of it as like you're, you're trying to describe a protocol, like a you know, consensus or something. What is actually, when do you actually observe mapping happening? Because um, maps, Typically, um, they talk about the data, right? Whereas TLA is, is much better suited uh, for talking about the process of the way data is shared, for example. So a lot of the time, actually, if you're using these sort of mappings, this is, might be an indication that your spec is not abstract enough. And they, you can actually do away with the concrete values. 
Um, again, it's very hard to talk in generalities here, but this is something that I would consider, right? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Let's thank... Uh